as you can see up here on the screen, we are going to address biblically, biblically, <laughs> the obscurities. Now, what is an obscurity? That is, okay, something that's been confused. So, God makes things plain and clear, and Satan obscures. He, um, you know, he, he makes things unclear. And oftentimes he does that by what? Hath God said? Surely you must be what? You must be confused about what God said. So we're going to biblically address specific obscurities of counterfeit gifts. And of course, I think that's what's going on here in 1 Corinthians. That is context that begins almost from the beginning, goes through at least chapter 14. So as already seen from the examples of Simon the sorcerer, not going, would you go push that button a couple of times for her, Braden? Uh, the examples of Simon the sorcerer of Acts chapter 8, and then of course the vagabond Jews who were practicing sorcery in Acts chapter 19, get her good at work. Thank you guys. What, what do we find from them? Well, they were both Jews and Gentiles who had been corrupted in their beliefs and practices, thinking that spiritual mir miracles could be manufactured. And we're trying to profit from doing so. Now, that is what we see going on in much of the, at least the, the Word of Faith movement. And it certainly manifested itself in, in latter times. Uh, as a young man, of course, uh, I saw this going on in the uh, Assembly of God with uh, Robertson, uh, the Tim and, uh, Jim and Tammy Baker, uh, on and on and on. And of course, it's developed now in a number of these, uh, what we would call the name it and claim it kind of theology that comes out of this Pentecostalism. So these false teachers that are being addressed uh, in the book of Acts and as well now in 1 Corinthians 14 were being exalted as spiritual leaders by who? The populace. And they were, the populace were ignorant of the miraculous operations of God. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is talking about the diversities of operations, which of course refers to dispensationalism. They assumed everything unexplainable had to be miraculous and from God. That's a first failure. Some things that are unexplainable didn't come from God. <laughs> And there were a lot of that going on in paganism. So correcting this falsity is the substance of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Not everything unexplainable is from God. What are other spiritual beings who counterfeit true spiritual things? Well, there is a God of this world, the Prince of Power of the Year. Then also there is the human heart, which is corrupt who wants everyone to think of us high, more highly than they ought to think and are willing to manufacture things in order to generate that kind of uh, view from other people who think of us more highly than we ought. Now, God is consistent in what he miraculously does. And demons, on the other hand, are authors of confusion, not God. So here in Acts chapter 2, we find this event at Pentecost. We read this a few weeks ago. And in verse 4, it says, And they all, they all saved disciples uh, present. That's, I believe, uh, all of the saved disciples that were there at this time were all filled with the Holy Ghost, filled, not baptized, and began to speak with other tongues, not unknown. Other tongues were known tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. What is this? This is spontaneity, not manufactured. 
was a, simply an act of the Spirit of God. In fact, they didn't even really know it, did they? Uh, they, they didn't know that they were speaking in one language and they were hearing in another language. They were not even cognizant of that. And verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. Who was the audience? Jews. Devout men out of every nation under, the, under heaven. Now they had come for Passover, stayed for 50 days after Passover on the day of Pentecost, which was a the Sunday after the seventh Sabbath. And they had stayed there for this Feast of the Tabernacles. Verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. And here's what they were con confounded about. Because that every man, what? Heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Now, Galileans, although they were Jewish Galileans, would have spoken in Greek. This was a common language of most of the Jews. And uh, a Jew who actually spoke Hebrews would have been called a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's why Paul calls himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews, because he not only was a Hebrew, but he spoke Hebrew. These Galileans, who were uneducated, they were fishermen primarily, most of them, and uh, they would have spoken Greek. And so how all of these would speak uh, Galileans, and how here we every man in our own tongue, so every man qualified that each one who spoke at one at a time, they spoke in Greek, and they were hearing them in their own tongue wherein we were born. And now he goes on and he lists, uh, I think there's 15 different here, some say 13, but my count is there 15. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, and uh, in Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia. Uh, Phygia, uh, Pamphylia in Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. These are born-again Gentiles practicing as Jews. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues. They did what? We heard them speak in our tongues the wonderful words, the wonderful works of God. Now, they were speaking in Greek, but they heard them speak in their own language. Now, that's a miracle of tongues. Now, this type of tongues experience in Acts chapter 2, 4 through 11 was probably the common occurrence within the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, we can see that from chapter 14, verse 18, where Paul says, I've spoken, I've spoken in tongues more than all of you. It was probably the common occurrence as he preached throughout his missionary journeys. I doubt very much if, even though Paul was a very well-educated man, he spoke Hebrew and Greek, I doubt, and of course multilingualism multi uh, <laughs> was common by uh, people in the Mideast, especially if they traveled at all. I don't think that was true of the Apostle Paul. I believe he spoke Hebrew and, and Greek. But yet, wherever he went, he was able to minister in those cities. I very much uh, doubt if he was able to speak all the languages. And the success he had in establishing churches among all of these various language groups may very well have been due to his gift of tongues as described and exemplified in the book of Acts. Now God's purpose in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and that's where we're going to go to today, is to establish a process of elimination of counterfeit tongues. Unknown tongues is the word here. An unknown tongue would have been a kind that was not a known language of anyone in the assembly. Otherwise, there was no one there who needed that language or could understand that language. So the interpreter is not to someone who can understand a language that doesn't exist and then given the gift to that interpretation, the gift would have been being able to understand the language and explain what they were saying. And if there was no one there that needed that language that was being uh, 
supposedly spoken, what would be the God's purpose? Why would God do that? If he wants to communicate truth to people, why would he communicate it into a language nobody understood? Or could be understood by anyone? So if an unbeliever was not present, the first one, the, the gift was counterfeit, the tongue's gift. Otherwise, not, it was not of God. God did not cause the tongue's event. Had to be an unbeliever present. Someone who needed that tongue, needed that language. And remember, it was a gift of hearing, not so much in the speaking. So the speaker still would have spoken in a known language, but it would have been translated into that person's uh, language from his lips to their ears. Now, that was a miracle of tongues that we find throughout the book of Acts. But now there was something else going on. It was bizarre. Because people were claiming that they were hearing angel languages. What's an angel language? And would God use an angel, angel language to communicate to humans? And when all of the languages we hear from angels anywhere in the Bible is that they spoke in languages that the people understood. Because they were bringing a message from God and the intent of the message was to communicate the message by a miracle. So the first disqualifying, now that's a key phrase here, the first disqualifying factor regarding a tongues event was that the purpose of tongues was assigned to unbelievers not believers, especially unbelieving Jews. Pentecostalism and some second blessing denominations teach that tongues are assigned to believers of what? That their salvation is now complete. How would they know that? By this manifestation of this sign gift. Look at chapter 14, verse 22, First Corinthians. What's the text say now? We're going to go to the Bible and get what the Bible says. And it's our hope that people who are caught up in these false beliefs will at least listen to what the Bible says. It's always encouraging when people are courageous enough to at least examine the things that they have believed for years. Maybe some of these folks have grown up in this and never heard anything else. At least to examine it and say, well, what does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 14, 22, where, 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, as being falsely taught that tongues were, would reveal when someone has received spirit baptism. That is what they teach. That's second blessing theology. Otherwise, that is how we know that we receive the baptism. This is, this is a manifestation of that. That's not true. So tongues are, uh, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying, although that's foretelling, uh, what has already been divinely revealed, serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So the purpose of forth telling the word of God is to people who believe the word of God. It is absolutely worthless to preach the word of God to people who don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. So when I began to help people, or want to help people come to Christ, I, I want to say, well, do you believe the Bible is the word of God? And if they say, well, I don't believe the Bible is the word of God, so I can't help you. I can't help people that don't believe the Bible because the only source of information about salvation and what is right and what is righteous is the word of God. So if you reject the word of God, that's Romans chapter 1, right? Romans chapter 1 says you reject the word of God, I can't help you. So that is a substance here. Now the second, that's the first disqualifier, tongues were assigned not to those that what? Not to those that believe not. But to them, or, or to, to, to to believers, but to assign to uh, to uh, assign to unbelievers, but not not to believers. So the second one here 
a disqualifying factor regarding the tongues of men. Was that, was, was that if more than two or three people spoke in tongues at any given service, and if it was not one after the other, not, not all at the same time, the tongues gift was counterfeit, and it was not of God. Now, I've been in a number of these types of meetings uh, when I was a young boy, and quite frankly, that's not what I saw. I saw many, many people all talking all at once. What, if I would have known this scripture, what, what, what should have happened? I would have gotten up and walked out. I said, this isn't of God. God didn't do this. So that's a disqualifying. 1 Corinthians 14, 27. If, what's the next word? Any man speak in an unknown tongue. Let it be. Well, what does it mean? Let it be. Now, those are italicized. The intent is, is here is what a qualifier is. If anybody is going to speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, and at the most by three in one service, and that by course, one after the other, and let one interpret. There has to be one person there who understands what they are saying because they speak that language. Okay, we've seen two disqualifying factors. By these two disqualifying factors, we would eliminate almost all of modern day tongues. But God isn't done yet. The third disqualifying factor regarding a tongues event was that, was that if at, uh, at the least one person was not able to interpret, to understand the language that being spoken, the tongues manifestation was counterfeit. 1 Corinthians 14.27 and if there was no one who could understand what the tongue speaker was saying, that person speaking in tongues was to be was was to keep silence. Literally, that I means stop talking out loud. The tongue's experience was to be stopped. And so, if somebody stood up and spoke in tongues, I'd say, "Anybody here understand what in the world this guy's talking about?" And there wouldn't be nobody there that could say, well, yeah, he's speaking in uh, Ukrainian. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can, I, I can interpret that. Well, who was the tongue's experience then for? The person who could speak the Ukrainian. There was something that God was giving to that particular person. Now, I remember listening to Dr. Frank Eberhardt give a testimony about uh, one of the friends that he had with him uh, who spoke a uh, different language. Uh, he was from a foreign country and he spoke a different language and they were going out and examining all of these charismatic movements and uh, these experiences. And, and uh, somebody got up and spoke in, a, in, a, in tongues and there was no interpreter there. And uh, so he stood up with this one man and says, well, I can interpret that. He said that was in my language, my home language. And that was some of the worst blasphemy I've ever heard that came out of this person's mouth. Blasphemy against the, uh, the person of Jesus Christ and blasphemy against God. And he interpreted what that person had said. That's, an, that's a biblical interpretation. So this, this third disqualifier is a pretty critical one. But what if there's no one there to do that, what should happen? Put a stop to it. Put a stop to it. So there's not, not somebody come up and said, well, yeah, he's speaking in, the, in angel languages. And uh, here I can interpret that. And I listened to that on the Rock Church one night. And, and some guy, he literally got up and he said, if I remember the words, because Patty and I laughed about it, it was um, um, the, the language of uh, Fred Flintstone he was speaking. And the, the language he used was yabba-dabba-doo, yabba-dabba-doo, yabba-dabba-doo. And he said that a 
about 35 times, somebody got up and said, I can interpret that. And he said, uh, God wants us all to bring more money. And so people flocked forward, brought more money. They had um, Kentucky Fried Chicken baskets, and they were filling them up. And so this guy, he's over here again, and he goes, yabba dabba do, yabba dabba do, same words. And the interpreter gets up and he says, I can interpret that. That's not enough money. Now we witnessed that on television watching this rock church, Pentecostal church. What should have happened? The tongue should have been stopped right there. Therefore, the tongue language being spoken needed to be the language of someone present that needed the tongue's gift in order to understand the message given. Remember, the gift was in the hearing, not the speaking. So if I was in there and that happened and someone spoke that language, I would have heard them speak in my language and I would have known right away that message is for me. And I better heed it very carefully. 1 Corinthians 14, 27. If, conditional, any man speak in an unknown tongue, one that is not known by everybody else, let it be by, what, two or at the most by three, and that by chorus, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him, the speaker, what? Keep silent, stop talking. And let him speak to himself and to God. Otherwise, he understands what he's saying, and God understands what he's saying. But there's no need for you to speak out loud in the church because no one else is understanding what you're saying. Tongues was for edifying, helping someone understand. So if nobody can understand, what's the sense of doing it? So the authenticity of prophecies was also to be challenged. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, let the prophet, same qualifier as the tongues, speak two or three and let the other judge. Now, if you're going to be one of the three prophets, uh, two or three that are speaking a new prophecy, and you got another one that's judging, you better hope that the one judging is uh, going to make a good evaluation of what you just said. If anything be revealed to another that said it's by, let the first hold his peace. Otherwise, shut up. <laughs> For ye may all prophesy, what? One by one, not everybody all at once, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject. Otherwise, new revelation always must be, must agree with previous revelation. So the prophets judge the prophets. So uh, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. If I come along and give you a prophecy that contradicts the scriptures in other places, if you were an Old Testament prophet, you'd be stoned. At the least in the New Testament church, you should be run out of the church. So only two or three prophets were allowed to speak at any given service. And all those present, otherwise other is actually plural in the text, others, in the Greek text, it's actually plural. All those present, other others, prophets, are to judge the prophecy according to accepted prophecies and the revealed truth by the apostles. So they were supposed to pass a judgment. So God is consistent in truth. And if any new revelation contradicted an old revelation, the contradicting prophecy is to be rejected along with the marking that prophet giving the false prophet as a uh, the false prophecy as a false prophet. And he was to be marked as a false prophet. So prophets were to speak in an orderly fashion one after the other. And if this order was not there, God was not giving the prophecy. Acts 17, verse 10, an example. 
And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Simus, Silas by night unto Berea. Now this was a community of Jews at Berea. So Paul and Silas go there. And uh, they're sent over here. So go over there and talk to these guys. Who coming hit thither went into where? The synagogue of the Jews. Now Paul was a trained theologian in Old Testament theology. But who had been corrupted by the theology. And now Christ took him into the Arabian desert for three years. Uh, after he was converted. And he taught Paul the gospel and how to be saved and corrected all of Paul's false theology that he had learned under the school of the rabbis. So he was prepared to go to the synagogue of the Jews and preach Jesus. He says in verse 11, these, the Bereans, the Jewish Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, those Jews. What does that mean? They listen. Their ears were open to the truth. And what did they do? In that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And did what? And searched the scripture daily whether those things were so. So they compared scripture to scripture. They took the Old Testament scriptures that Paul expounded to them. And they compared them to other scriptures. And they found out what? This guy knows what he's talking about. And many of them to believe her. But what does it say? They were more noble. What was the dif what was the difference? The other Jews wouldn't hear. Paul had converted him to this Christianity, and now he was out there preaching Jesus, and, and they'd already killed Jesus, and, and they didn't want to hear somebody preaching Jesus. But the Berean brethren, these Jews at Berea, they were more noble. They opened their ears. That's uncommon today. Even among many today in systemic theologies, uh, there are all kinds of these today, and certainly those within Pentecostalism, who just aren't willing to open their, open their ears to hear something different than what they believe. So that's always encouraging to an old preacher when you have somebody who's willing to be more noble like these Bereans who actually listen to what the Word of God has to say. Look over to 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 19. Peter here is talking, of course, in this epistle about false prophets. It is a, a, a crown from a Jewish man who is dealing with, written primarily to Jews, as 2 Peter is, about false prophets. And he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. What's he talking about? The things that Paul taught, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, why is it more sure? Because it has been affirmed by the one who wrote it. That is Jesus Christ. He was the giver of Old Testament prophecy. He is the incarnate word of God. Second person of the Trinity. Whereunto ye do well, ye plural, do well that you take heed. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. That's Christ. Knowing this first. Otherwise, here's something that is right at the top of the list of the things you should know. That no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Otherwise, Scripture interprets Scripture. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but what? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What's he talking about? They didn't make this stuff up by themselves. They were given the words to say by God himself. And God's going to be consistent in what he says. Now let's look at the fourth disqualifying, uh, disqualifying factor regarding a tongue's bit. It was that if a woman spoke in tongues, the tongue's event was counterfeit. 
Women were not allowed to prophesy or speak in tongues. And the purpose of tongues in the church was for teaching, edification, and women were not allowed to teach in the churches when adult men were present. We practice that here. We don't allow women to teach in junior church, or more pre prevalently, we would say, we don't allow anyone over, any boys over the age of 12 years old to go down to junior church. Because there's women that teach there. And the age of 13, over now 13 is over the age of 12, was when a young Jewish boy would be considered a man and go through his bar mitzvah and uh, be declared an adult. So we practice that here. Now, most people are going to say, well, that's just old archaic uh, Bible stuff. And we're now living in a new era and a new generation, and this is not applicable today. You know what that's called? Fluid constructionism. Fluid constructionism is coming out of theology, by the way, not out of politics. It's later applied in politics. Otherwise, we interpret the Constitution fluidly according to the culture. And that's what, they, that's what this is, the same thing. Fluid constructionism came out of, of uh, liberal theology, saying the culture now, God is evolving. God is changing. And the God of the Old Testament is not the same as the God of the New Testament. The God of the New Testament is much more loving and more caring and not judgmental. Well, yeah, I think you're going to have a pretty wide, rude awakening uh, when that day finally comes where you have to stand before you. So, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 says, Let your women keep silence in the church. Now, we'll look at that word in just a moment. Because we're going to compare it to the word used in 1 Timothy 2, 11. But let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. What's he talking about? What's the context? In tongues. So right behind that verse, it's not permitted for them to speak in tongues. That's what the text is about. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they, now he's taking this a little higher. He says, if they will learn anything. Let them ask their husbands at home. So I've said over the years, my job as a pastor is not to teach women. They do learn. In fact, women have a tendency to learn better, and they have a tendency to become more involved in preaching and take better notes than men do. But my responsibility is to teach the men who are to teach their wives and children at home. Now, unfortunately, that's not what goes on in many cases. So it says, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands, where? At home. For it is a shame for women to speak. The context is to preach or teach in the church. So tongues was for edifying, to teach. And women were what? Commanded not to do that in the church, especially when men were adult men were present. So that's what 2 Timothy there, 1 Timothy 2.11 talks about. Let the women, what, learn in silence. Now, this is a different Greek word that's used, uh, in, in that, that's used in 1 Corinthians 14, 34. He says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man. This was in the church, but to be in silence. For the reason why, here, Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. What's he talking about? Adam knew exactly what he was doing. The woman allowed her emotions to get in the way. And she rationalized. Now, I'm not saying men are not people who tend to rationalization. But Eve rationalized. And she listened to the questions, hath God said. You should not surely die. And she rationalized. Adam, he knew exactly what he was doing. He obeyed his wife rather than God. And he succumbed to her rationalization. 
We are not to do that. As, as men, we are to simply take a stand upon the word of God and do what the word of God says. We are to be factually and objective, not subjective in the things that we make decisions upon. Now, are all men that way? No, we're fallen too. So after the fall, I think that there is a degree of that we become similar in that direction, but it is true that men make the decision based upon facts. Women tend to make decisions based upon emotions. And that can become a major problem. Otherwise, women need uh, security, and they're willing to make decisions to keep that security. Men need, to res need respect, and they're willing to compromise truth to get it. Isn't that sad? That's the way we are. Now let's deal with these two different Greek words. Two different Greek words I use for silence in these two portions of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians, regarding tongues, the Greek word is sakeo, meaning to be kept in silence or stop talking. And it's used twice here. In 1 Corinthians, or 1 Timothy 2.11 and 12, the Greek word is husake, which means quietness or meekness which is also substantiated by the context. It's a description of a life of one who stays at home doing their own work and does not officiously meddle with the affairs of others. I've often said there, there's a, a dangerous person in the church when you have a woman who wants to be a preacher. And if that woman is your husband, you better, better guard that pretty carefully. Because <laughs> I've known a few of that and and they've been nothing but a source of trouble. What? Oh, let me clarify then if I mess that all up. There is a big problem when a woman wants to be a preacher. And her husband uh, is, is influenced by that because all she does is she's the puppet and he becomes the mouthpiece. And I've seen it just, you know, a half a dozen times in the churches where I've pastored. And almost always, that, that woman is, is a source of enormous problems. I remember preaching in a church down in Madison, Wisconsin. I was invited there to preach. And on the, I preached Sunday school Sunday morning and Sunday evening uh, there. And uh, uh, after uh, Sunday school... Uh, we're supposed to end at such and such a time, and I had run over just a little bit, and the, the wife of the pastor standing over here going like this I at her watch. And I said, well, just give me a minute. I want to finish this up. And I said, well, it won't be a problem. Just a couple more minutes. And as I was finishing up what I had to say, she starts ringing the bell, starts pushing that bell. I said to my wife after that service on our way home today, I said, that, that church is going to be a problem. They couldn't get somebody there to come and take that church after they left. And that, those people left went to another church that was a good, strong, solid church. But they undermined the pastor there and led about half of that church out of there to go follow them to start another church, which they destroyed in the process. So they destroyed three churches that I knew. Where did it all come from? A woman who usurped authority. And I don't know, her, her husband was not a strong enough man to say, hey, stop that immediately. So uh, for Christians today, tongues have passed away. Say that with me. For Christians today, what? Tongues have passed away. There's no gift of tongues for today. If the modern day practice of tongues were applicable, the places it would be the most apparent would be on the mission field, where foreigners go to preach the gospel to another language group where the missionaries do not speak that language. But yet that's not where we find it. That's not what's going on. It's tongues spoken in one language to people that don't know anything uh, about the language that's being spoken, but yet 
It's by people who speak the language of which they're there. <laughs> so if the modern day practice of tongues were consistently evaluated according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, according to the four disqualifiers, every one of them would be proven false for the following reason. I'll give you all four of them, or all five of them. First, those that practice modern day tongues state tongues were given to prove a person is saved. This is a contradiction against 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Tongues are not uh, for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Number two, the purpose of tongues was to communicate edifying truth, not to give prophecy. Most modern day tongues are used to prophesy. That's, that's false. Otherwise, they're saying here, God has told me this, and here's what he wants you to do. That's prophecy. And that's false. Now you say, why? Well, I, I don't know if I can agree with that. Well, then if you don't agree with it, remember that we have an open canon. Then. And if that's still going on today, God's still writing the Bible. But we know from Revelation that that's not true. You're not to add or take from the prophecies that were already given by John. Number three, modern day tongues are usually done in great confusion, disorder, and with many people speaking all at the same time. That's not of God. If more than one person at a time speaks in tongues or more than three in any given service, immediately you can know God's not doing it because God's not the author of confusion, and that would be confusing. If someone gets up and they speak two things that are completely contrary, obviously God's not doing that. Number four, women are not allowed to speak in tongues. Yet the vast majority of tongues today is by women. If women speak in tongues, it's not God that's doing it. And then number five, the real miracle of speaking in tongues was in the hearing, not in the speaking. Now, I'm not a big fan of John MacArthur. I have probably every book he's written, and that's a lot of books. <laughs> but he did write a book called The Charismatics a number of years ago, and this is what he said in one of the concluding chapters. He says, the tragedy in accepting the counterfeit is that we forfeit the genuine. And that is what happens within charismatic churches. The prophecy spoken of in 1 Corinthians 13.8 is a declaration of divinely revealed truth. And in the case of 1 Corinthians 13.8, the emphasis of this guest upon the revealing the truth by God, not its, not its declaration. So this is truth that's being now revealed to someone so that they can explain it to someone else. The supernatural aspect of the gift of prophecy in Romans chapter 12 and verse 8 is the opposite. It's on the declaration. It's upon the understanding, upon the explanation of what God has already revealed in the prophetic books of the Bible. What's that called? Preaching. Preaching is the declaration, the understanding, and the explanation of what God has already revealed in his Bible. So if special revelatory prophecies continue, we would have a continuing, expanding Bible. My Bible has been received almost exactly the same. And the only thing that's been added to it is the length of the concordance. <laughs> The same words that were written 2,000 years ago are the same words that are in it right now. So this is not the testimony of Scripture that we have a continually expanding Bible. Once the last book of the Bible was recorded, prophecy ceased. Right there. There hasn't been anyone. So you've got someone saying to you, "Here, God has told me, or God has said. That person is declaring they're a prophet. And the warning to those who profess to be to possess the gift of continuing special revelatory prophecies 
that add to what God says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, the warning to them is severe and especially graphic. He says in verse 18 of Revelation 22, the last of the, the last state, one of the last statements in the, in the prophecies of John. For I test unto, testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecies of this book, that's the book of Revelation, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now, you've got a prophet today. Somebody is giving you prophecies. Uh, you don't have to go and, and, and argue and debate the issue. Take them to Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. And you say, no, prophecy is closed. The canon is closed with the last verse of Revelation chapter 22. There is no more prophecy. So the various uh, Phrases, they, they shall finish, or they shall fail, they shall vanish away, done away. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 1 Corinthians 13, 9, put away, 1 Corinthians 13, 11, are all translated from the same Greek word, katargio, which means to unemploy, to deactivate power, to cause to seize, to put to an end to do away with, to annul, or abolish. I think it's pretty clear. Therefore, all sign gifts were for but a short season, at the latest, 60 years. From 33 AD until uh, 96 AD. At 66 Year or ninety or sixty three years. That's a, that's the most. And the reason why was to miraculously show the Jews that the new covenant had begun, and that the temple order had been set aside. Hosea two eleven. We'll look at that next week. And these sign gifts were a partial and temporary fulfillment, already not yet, of Joel two twenty eight and twenty nine. And they would look for the full fulfillment after the restoration of the nation of Israel and at the second coming of Jesus to establish his kingdom, his 1,000 year reign on earth. I think we can be pretty clear here. I, I think when I say we can be pretty clear, we can be pretty clear because the Bible is pretty clear. Now, examine what we see going on today in the modern Pentecostal charismatic second blessing movement, and we can readily see that what's going on today, God's not doing that. Now, I'm not going to try to ascribe who's doing it, but I believe that is the context of 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, the first whole epistle of 1 Corinthians, if God's not doing it, then one of two things is happening. It's the prince and power of the air, the Antichrist. Or two, it is manufactured. False. Unknown. Not defined. And we should then call those people, not just to repentance, but call them to the truth. Because it's only by the truth if they will open their ears like the Berean brethren who were more noble than the other Jews because they searched the scriptures to see what was true. Now people will open their ears to what the scriptures say just by the process of elimination. Okay, if that happened, God didn't do it. 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 There's four disqualifiers. If God didn't do it, then it's either manufactured or it's satanic. It's cultic. Now that's hard for many people who have come to me and they say, well, yeah, but this has happened to me. Well, 
I said, well, that's up to you. You don't have to compare it to what the Word of God says. You can be like the Berean brethren who were more noble than the other Jews because they actually compared what was happening to the Word of God. And they interpreted it according to the Word of God. <sighs> Unfortunately, the counterfeit goes a little dear, more, more seriously deep because what happens is that they now interpret that they're saved by this gift. Now, I, I believe that there are Pentecostals who are saved people. But a, there's a problem with the false teaching that says your salvation isn't completed until it's manifested by this special, these special gifts. But yet, even if it's completed, it's not completed because you can lose it. That's, I got a big problem with that. Theologically. Becomes a big problem. And we have to pray for people because I think many of them, although they may be saved, might not be saved. Because they don't even understand the foundation of salvation. That it is a gift of God. You have nothing to do with it but to receive it. You can't keep it. And there's nothing you can do in, in under the sun other than what God is doing through your life. Our Father, we bow and close this time together. Thank you for the truth of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And that, Lord, you are clear and concise about what you say. We pray for those who are confused, that, Lord, they'd open their hearts as the Berean brethren did, who were more noble because they searched the scriptures daily as to what you said. In Jesus' name, amen.